I'm so out of practice with this high church stuff. How many of you are out of practice with this high church stuff? Oh my goodness. I'm having to look, read, at the, read the bulletin so closely just to make sure that I'm, I know where we are in the service. So where are you going and where have you been? This is the title of the Joyce Carol Oates, Oates novel taken from the question that the angel presents to Hagar after she slips away from Abram and Sarai and has ventured out on her own. Where are you going? The angel asks her. And where have you been? And I remember standing in a Borders bookstore, pulling that book off the shelf and just being transfixed by that title. Now I knew the backstory, I knew the, 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 the plot to the story because I was supposed to read that book in college. But oops, <laughs> I didn't. But I remember the class discussion on the book, so I kind of knew what the book was about. And I also knew the backstory, how uh, Joyce Carol Oates had been inspired to write the book, Where Are You Going and Where Have You Been, after hearing the Bob Dylan song, It's All Over Now, Baby Blue. But as I stood there in Borders, I was captivated by the questions that are the title of this book, which is the quote from Genesis. Where are you going and where have you been? And these are questions of existential angst. And as a Gen Xer, I am full of existential angst. It's what we are as Xers. We are just full of angst. And I ask myself these questions all the time, particularly on my birthday, particularly on birthdays that end in fives and zeros. Where am I going? And where have I been? But we are all prone to these type of self-reflective questions, I think. Whenever major events occur in our lives, births, birthdays, anniversaries, graduations, marriages, death, these life cycle events often prompt us to ask these type of deep philosophical and theological questions. Where are we going? And where have we been? And even as collectives, as a community, as a people, we are often drawn to asking these type of questions. Where are we going and where have we been? We ask these questions every four years as we elect a new president to be the, the leader of our country. We are asking the questions in those elections. Where are we going and where have we been? Whenever there is the death of a major cultural or societal icon, we ask those questions. Where are we going and where have we been? Whenever an economic upturn or downturn begins or ends, we ask those questions. Whenever a war starts or wherever an a war is over, we ask the questions. Where are we going and where have we been? And today we celebrate the 500th birthday or anniversary of the symbolic start of the Protestant Reformation, which means that there are two zeros in this birthday, which means I think we should do a double amount of reflection on these existential questions. So I think a little self-reflection, a little holding up the, of the mirror and, daisy, and gazing deeply into our collective soul is called for today on the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Because if we use today only to pat ourselves on the back and to congr congratulate ourselves of being in the line of Luther and of the branch of Calvin, we do a disservice to all of the memories of the men and women who have reformed this church through the last 500 years, and more importantly, we do a dishonor and a disservice to God. And we need to acknowledge that the Reformation wasn't always a good thing. Wars were fought. Luther may thought he might have just been nailing 95 cordial debates topics to adore, but wars were fought over these things. The Thirty-Year War in Germany and Eastern Europe killed thousands as Catholics slaughtered Protestants, and Protestants gave just as much back in kind. And many historians have pointed out that much 
of Luther's anti-Semitic thoughts and beliefs and writings laid the roots that 400 years later were scooped up by the Third Reich and used as propaganda. His own words were used on posters of, and, and, and in newspaper articles to dehumanize Jews so that they could propagate the final solution. And as church historian Dr. Martin Marty rightly points out, the Reformation may have begun by protesting one pope, but in the process, it created a thousand new ones. As Mar pointed out today, we all wear the hat. But it wasn't all bad. We also have to remember and give thanks for the Reformation. In the words of Reverend Dr. Scott Allen Johnson, a time, the Reformation was a time when the Spirit had led the church kicking and screaming into a new reality. And we ought to pray that the Spirit will do the same to us, even if it means dragging us kicking and screaming into that new reality. And we ought to always recommit ourselves to living out the classic Protestant motto, the Reformed Church always being reformed according to the Word of God. I actually said the Latin in the 830 service and butchered it so bad I spared you that... <laughs> David, thanks, David. It, wasn't bad. it was bad. <laughs> and, the and the Reformation laid the groundwork for social movements that would take root 200 years later, bringing us to democracy. It is not that far of a leap to go from the priesthood of all believers to the rule of the people, for the people, and by the people. And when our forebears of this country wrote the Declaration of Independence. It used a lot of Protestant theology to, to, to form and to craft that document. And once one denounces the ultimate authority of the divine infallibility of the Pope, the logical next step is to denounce the ultimate authority of the divine right of kings and queens. It's not that big of a leap. The Reformation also should be praised and given thanks for giving women a new venue to share their own gifts and voices. And though it would have been another 200, 250 years before women were able to be, that were given the opportunity to be a professional, officially adored, uh, uh, ordained minister, the Reformation women could preach and pray openly in churches and write hymns. Did you know the very first Protestant hymn was written by a woman, Elizabeth Krusiger, who wrote the hymn, Lord Christ, God's Only Son? The first Protestant hymn written in 1524 was written by a woman. And it was included in the very first Protestant hymnal. And she was excommunicated for this. But she was welcomed into the Luther home, and she became a leader, and a Bible study leader, and a prayer leader in the church in Wittenberg. So yes, in 500 years, the, Christ, the, the explosion of Christian denominations may have gotten out of hand, going from one after a thousand years, or in the beginning to two after a thousand years, to three after 1,500 years, to 1,400 after 2,000 years. But those, two, those 1,400 denominations have brought remarkable breadth and richness and color of all the differing ways that people worship and come to understand who God is. Many of you were raised and reared in one of those 1,400 denominations, and you have now joined our congregation. That is a blessing. And this place would not exist without the Reformation. Because if Christians weren't bad Jews, and Protestants not bad Catholics, and Congregationalists not bad Anglicans... There would be no United Church of Christ, and there would be no Kensington Community Church, and I am forever grateful for that. If we weren't so bad at stuff, we would never exist. So we mark this Sunday, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, in the humble confession and the joyful conviction that God, through God's amazing grace, is not done reforming the church and the world. And that that reformation and that reformation work will continue on through us. We are reformed. And God is continually reforming us and all of creation by an everlasting, all-powerful love that is gifted to us by grace. So the question this morning is, where are we going and where have we been? 
Luther was driven by two primary questions that tormented him. He was tormented by his own salvation, and he was tormented by the corruption of the 16th century church. He was terrified that he had not done enough to ensure his place in paradise when he breathed his last, last and his life would end. And he feared that God's punishment, he feared God's punishment, even though he wrote, I have lived a blameless life. Luther was prone to humility. <laughs> and then he despised the practice of selling indulgences. That was the 16th century practice of the church to pay for a special mass for yourself or for a loved one on their behalf to reduce the time that one would spend in purgatory before they ascended to heaven. And the greatest seller of indulgences, the P.T. Barnum of indulgences, was a man named Johann Tetzel. And legend has it that he once said, when the coin hits the plate, the soul enters the pearly gates. And whether or not that's true or not, does it matter? You get the point. And what would count in 21st century American terms as hundreds of millions of dollars in today's currency was raised in the selling of indulgences, much of it on the back of the poor. When they had started the selling of indulgences, the 16th century church, after nine years, they voided all of those indulgences out, saying that if you had purchased one of those indulgences and had not used it, it was void and no longer good, and you needed to purchase a new one. Who said that free market capitalism didn't exist in the 16th century? So indulgences went to pay for the renovation of St. Peter's Basilica, which many of us have visited, which has been a blessing to us and the entire world of Christendom that has inspired us and moved us with its beauty. But it also funneled money to Spain to help the Spanish crown wage the Spanish Inquisition, where hundreds, thousands of Jews and Muslims were either expelled or slaughtered. And because the money from indulgences had been given to the crown of Spain through, by the Pope, Spain had extra money to throw towards vanity projects, like, I don't know, like funding three little ships, looking for a new route to India and China, captained by one kind of crazy guy with a weird view of the world named Christopher Columbus. See, it's all connected, all of it. So Luther twisted in his dark night over his apparent fate as a sinner to, end, to endless days in purgatory or worse damnation, and he raged against the, exhort, the, the extortion of the poor, and he sat in his tiny office in the University of Wittenberg, and he poured over the scriptures, particularly Romans 5, and then the Holy Spirit came upon him, and lo, one little word felled him, and that one little word was grace. Grace. Grace his fears relieved. Grace redeemed the world, though the world was filled with devils that threatened to undo it. Grace balanced the ledger and made the world as it was on the sixth day of creation when God declared that it was very good. And grace for Luther got him going and allowed him to be reconciled to where he had been. In that one word, grace, God spoke to Luther. And Luther found his voice to speak out. And bef because before... He nailed, had the courage to nail those 95 theses to the door in Wittenberg on that church. Luther had not written one single word of scholarship that had ever been published. And he is, was somewhat of a recluse. But by the Holy Spirit, he found his voice. He found his gift. And boy, did he ever use it. And then the Holy Spirit called other reformers forth. And the Holy Spirit has not stopped calling reformers forth. And now the Holy Spirit is calling us forth this day into a new reality, a reformed people. And we are called to continue the work of reforming ourselves and the church and the world to be co-creators with God, to bring about the blessed fruits of the kingdom of God, the peaceable reign of God on earth as it is in heaven. 
you may or may not be tormented this day by the thought of your own death and mortality and your place in paradise, like Luther was. But if you are, let me assure you this morning, let me assure you of God's grace and love for you, each and every one of you. As Luther poured over Paul's letter to the Romans, I pour over Genesis 1. And in it, I find the word, sisters and brothers, speaking to me, speaking to us, so that we can find our voice to preach blessedness and good news and belovedness and responsibility. And we need courage to call out our own 21st century indulgences. We might not be selling get-out-of-jail-free cards, but we've got our own abuses that we must name. Oh, and oh boy, is the list long. Even 500 years of Reformation, the list is so long. But just setting the list aside and naming grievances isn't called good news. And if we started listing them, we'd be here for another 500 years. But the endurance to persevere against those abuses and those indulgences have built an unshakable character to this place, to you people, to my sisters and brothers in Christ that fills us with the hope of the Holy Spirit. And that is grounded in blessedness and belovedness and a courage to live into the responsibility to live out the good news. And 55, 55 theses that we nail to our doors this morning are words of affirmation and challenge and hope that have been built out of an endurance that we use to meet the suffering of our lives and the world through what we have experienced. I encourage you to take time this morning or read the Chimes newsletter when it comes out on Wednesday to read these 55 theses because you will see words of challenge and affirmation of belovedness and blessedness and responsibility. You'll see words that say we can no longer be exclusive in the Christian church. We have to open up ourselves to, to reach out to our sisters and brothers and other faiths without ever reducing our own identity as Christians. You will see that there are words that say we have to get over this tension and war with science. That science and religion are not at tension with one another, but that they, are share, that they share a language of beauty and, mir and miracle that can open ourselves up to how God works in the universe. You will see on that list people sharing how they have been abused by dogma in other congregations, but they have found a safe place to discover who they are in the midst of you. You'll see and read in there that people, that people just affirm that Kensington Community the Church is a place where my children want to come to church. And that's a huge blessing. You'll read on that list that we have to confront that the, the Christian church through its years, and even to this day, still pr prioritizes men and heterosexuals and people and non-people of color. You will see on that list that there is an apocalypse coming, and it's not one coming from God. It's one that we have created with our own hands, with our own abuse of creation, and with our own exorbitant uh, ide idolizing of technology. And we have to do something to curb that apocalypse that is coming. These are words that call us forth to say, where have you been? But also, where are we going? What is the suffering that we have endured that brings forth character? Character that then gives us hope. Hope, which is a powerful elixir to help us overcome that which ails us so that we can take an immense and miraculous step into the future and we can look and say, this is where we're going. We are going towards belovedness. We're going 
towards blessedness. We're going towards affirmation and love through the guidance of the Holy Spirit because of God's eternal, amazing, and everlasting love and grace. And that, sisters and brothers, is the good news this day on the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Amen.